class will miss that amazing run of three answers. Um, they'll just, they'll like tune in right now and everybody's laughing. Gotta remind me to hit record. Okay, secluded, complicated, leaders, weird, simple, simple tongues. Oh, all right, we've covered our bases. Um, complex, overrated, entitled person, men, macho, powerful, trash. Oh, trash always makes the list. Still, even though I know it always makes the list, I'm not quite ready for it each time. <laughs> um, no different. All right. Whew. Well, it's not a lot of love coming out there this morning, but that's okay. That's okay. I see words like interesting, powerful, strong, masculine. Um, great. Okay. Good list. Look, we'll talk about these when we get through all of them. All right. Describe the female gender in a word. Okay, let's cue this up. Here we go. Strong, 14. Now, the number of the, I think the first one maybe for males was strong, perhaps, but it was only at seven. So 14. Strong. Number two at eight, powerful. Number three, emotional. Uh, next, feminine, fighting. Fighting. Fighting made it like with two responses. Uh, fertile, two responses. Oppressed, stronger. Resilient, power, complicated, queens, yes, hardcore, uh, underprivileged, the social, social psychological state of mind that culturally defines you as female. Thank you, robot student. I, I, I don't know. I don't know who did that. That's awesome. Oh, my goodness. I wish we had like, I sh yeah, if we had like an answer, a robot student answer for everything, I would really, I'd like that. I'm a huge Futurama fan. All right, confident, judgmental, magic estrogen, caring, fragile, complex, beautiful, unique, equal, person, compassion, courageous, underprivileged, control, nice. All right, all right, all right, all right, so internalize. I got a couple lists, got a couple lists going on there. That's, these are always great lists. Oh my goodness. Kind of makes Top Hat worth it all at once. If you've been participating with Top Hat, and I can see that you haven't just dropped off the planet for three or four weeks at a time, you'll likely get full points for participation. Don't worry about what it says in the top hat book. It's more important to me that we generate a good discussion with things like this. All right. Um, uh, all right, so describe transgender in a word. All right, change, number six for change, number one, brave, uh, six. Number two, different, misunderstood, unique, new, Questionable, important, non-existent, resilient, men, women, bold, unapologetic, themselves, not my business, opposite, unassigned, different gender, natural, decisive, free, changing, uh, human. All right. All right. So we've got our list. Uh, they are very, they're different, right? Let's talk about these lists. All three of these lists are quite different. Um, yep, I'm just gonna, like I do it normally, uh, react, thoughts about these lists, any of the particular words, any trends in the list, you could pick anything right now, as we sort of, you know, I mean, this is like gender momentum, gender habit energy, gender stereotypes, gender realities, right? Um, some of it's like anatomical, and I don't think the anatomical thing quite made it as much, there's my, to the list, there's to the female list, as it did uh, the mail list. There's my observation, but, but I have seen many of these lists, so go ahead and react. Thoughts, sociological observations. My computer appears to still be working. Who's in it? I can't hear anybody. I'm just trying really hard not to like impulsively say all the things I want to say about like whoever said non-existent for transgender. That's, mm, but um, a point I wanted to make for for the like gender male one. Nobody mentioned that like nobody brought up that like they are expected to behave um, like not be emotional. And I noticed like the female one did say emotional, but it's kind of a human thing to have emotions. So I was kind of interested in that how like nobody thought to say like men can cry you know and men can feel feelings right not um, a whole lot of feely emotional word right? right like i don't think compassionate made the list Lo lovey 
dad, did dad even make the, you know, something like, and, and they're not all negative. Um, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Um, for sure. Okay. Uh, good observation. Uh, who else has an observation? And yeah, there's a lot to process with these lists for sure. I was kind of surprised with the, the list to describe females because I honestly expected more like delicate words almost. Like that's what I expected, but I heard a lot of like of the opposite of like strong and the, the queen. So yeah, that was cool. I thought good to hear that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very positive to hear that. And I'll tell you because I've been listening to those lists for many years, we're missing some of the fancy, lovey, uh, gently stuff here and have traded up for powerful and strong and queens and uh for sure and i look at the coolest part actually about these lists i suppose now that i have this youtube channel right you could check back next year if anybody cared or next semester probably don't but is to see these lists and how they change over time that's that's what's really kind of cool um when we're talking about food or when we're talking about race or when we're talking about gender because i say right away right that uh that no culture, culture is not stagnant. It's one of the first things that we talk about. And yet it's consistently proved from semester to semester to semester in the answers that students give. Really would be great to have an archive of these in some kind of way um, for that. Okay, what else? Other observations, things that stand out to you. Kind of looking back at the list, but what do you think? I kind of felt like the list for like man, man was um, kind of more negative or like, like, I don't know, like, like the ones for women seemed really empowering, like strong and capable and that sort of stuff. But like for men, it was like penis and stoic, you know, it wasn't like, it, it was just like kind of felt like it had a negative connotation almost. To it. Sure. And I'm looking back here, at least I do, I do see, um, dependable, um, tenacious. And sometimes we can take some of these things. We know that, that tenacious is maybe, maybe that's a good, a good thing. Whereas sometimes when you see something like predominant, it's, yeah, you know, right. Like that's, that's maybe dominant in this context isn't as positive, but you know, misunderstood is here. Um, confident is here person. I mean, that's kind of cool, right. You know, um, because some of these things are stereotypes and that's okay that stereotypes make this list. It helps us understand as human beings, why we could, why these things continue. That's the whole point of studying these things sociologically, because then they link up to something like how we do pay in this culture. Very important life expectancy of somebody based on race or gender. Very important, right? Health epidemiology in relation to socioeconomic status. Again, very important. So to me, um, it's, it's more important that we come up with a complete list that includes stereotypes. Um, but yeah, a bit more negative overall. I, and I would say these lists do tend to be that way um, when we compile them in class. As a matter of fact, so much so that by the time my class is done with the male list, tears and eyes, feelings hurt all at the same time. And no, I mean tears and eyes from laughing so hard at some of these things, but also the brutalness of this list. It, it is the one thing all semester long that's like, it's the most charged energy thing all semester long, which is interesting. Um, okay, what else about the lists or about these gender stereotypes or about our views of, um, you know, male, female, trans? Um, I was looking at the list and I think that the fact that we're saying like men, when like it's such like simp is like a new word for being in a relationship or like, oh, you're doing what your girlfriend said you want, like, you have to do and then the boys call him a simp and I think like that is a reason why no one puts emotion in because even if he is trying to show emotion then they're like oh you're just being such a girl or oh you're just a simp or blah 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 so I think that really is a reason why men are like kind of nervous on showing their emotions and feelings but I do think it's good if they're sensitive because I think at least one like we can't have two non-sensitive people because if we have like women as empowering like men got to take over then and do some sort of more sensitive i don't know that's my opinion on it <laughs> um i think that's a great opinion thank you that's why i love sociology that's i sorry i think it's i think it's the best like body of classes going because of what we really get to there yeah what a of course there's a lot of disadvantage and discrimination um 
for trans folks, for people who identify as a gender female. We know, we know that to be sure, it's, it's the easiest to see. But imagine if you decided to show emotion because that's what you're feeling connected with and then that's a catch 22, right? Now you're a sin. Um, and you know what? See, my boys started using that word like I wouldn't know what it means and I immediately knew, I'm like, that sounds, that does not sound, they're like, that's a positive thing. And they were like, like in the last week, I've been verified in two of my classes. And so I hear these things all the time. Last semester it was, um, uh, what's the, with the, they carry around the bottles, uh, the Nalgene bottles and the thing, Visco. Visco, Visco girl. girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So last, I, would, I didn't know about that. And last semester as a sociologist, fascinated so I did a whole class lecture on it like I went in and dug deep <laughs> it was it was so much fun but now see they've been lying to me for a long time because I'm good with language and I just never really checked it out yeah and so I busted them last night actually it was just last night I'm like man I know simp isn't because they have all the pog it's like a thing you know right I trust me folks I'm having a father that's a sociologist I'm having so much fun. I'm having so much fun. And they can't pull anything past me, I'm telling you. Um, but yeah, okay, good. Um, I think that's great. Yep, to be able to be emotional but be criticized as such. Um, I don't know, yeah. I think all of these gender role pieces are changing. Um, and I see that one changing as well. And goodness gracious, uh, long overdue. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm a musician and I cry at the end of every single, even like a Marvel movie, you know? Like you, you start playing Cat Stevens, even if it's a CGI tree, I'm gonna be bawling. That's just what's happening. We just watched Miracle on 34th Street, bawling. I don't even know, is there something that I haven't bawled at the end of in the last month? Probably not. Anyway, awesome, yeah, yeah, great. So, okay, more about the list, anything else? I think that was great, great uh, sociological observation. Horrible movies are the most emotional movies. To be fair, they are. They are. That's hilarious. Uh, any any more observations? I've only uh, I've only incorporated the last four or five years, um, really consciously into the class, the question about uh, transgender folks. So, um, any observations about that list? Because I think that that list. I thought that there was things that I was like, eh. and then I thought there was a lot on that list where I was like, yeah, like a very powerful, positive thing. But any, any observations that you made about that or any of the other lists? I thought it was interesting that like a couple of people said, said brave. I just like, cause I was thinking about that. Like I identify as queer, right? So blah, 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 blah. But like people, people always tell me that it's like, oh, you're so brave. And it's like, I'm just being myself. So I always find that like connotation interesting when like, because they're doing something different or like something that's like against, you know, the little, little boxes we all put ourselves in. <laughs> I don't know. I thought that was interesting that a lot of people said that. Yeah. Um, what constitutes bravery and how does that change over time for human beings? I mean, that, honestly, sociologists, it's just like, there's just too many really awesome, interesting angles to look at things from that seem sort of infinite to me. Who else? Anybody else about uh, that or any of the other lists? I think you should make a, a list next year for non-binary because it's different from transsexual, transgender. Just by the, I just think that, that would be cool to see people's reactions to that too. Uh, absolutely agreed. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. That's uh, duly noted and will do for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, matter of fact, really, I could sit around, I could just sit around outside of class time and make up questions that I just want to give to people because I find it so interesting and probably definitely will need to dive deeper into that because it looks like we're going to have at least a spring semester that's going to be, you know, for me all online anyway, you know, as, as we do that. So, all right. Um, well, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of important stuff happening with this chapter. We've had some good discussions about it. I've got the lectures that are up, so I'm going to move on to the next chapter. Um, you know, just the sake of um, I'd love to see what people say with non-binary or gender. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And you know, actually, one of the things that I'm missing would be like the programming that they have of people that come and lecture that you can go to throughout the course of the semester. 
that's like a huge part of college is all these people that the different departments bring in that you can hear talk about these things. Um, and even my own classes, um, you know, uh, some fantastic folks from Denver for four or five years in a row that used to come up and speak to my class, transgender individuals, um, uh, Vietnam sniper, uh, Olympic gold medal skier, you know, and, and important stories, uh, but funny stories, humanizing stuff, just really important stuff. I just remember Steve, he, I think he's um, a skiing instructor, gold medal, gold medal skier, invites his girlfriend up to his cabin in Aspen. They're going to go skiing. She goes to change in his bedroom. She comes out holding up a pair of underwear, a pair of women's panties. And, 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 and she says, well, what, what do you think? What do you think she's thinking? Say it. There's another woman. Yeah. And he's like, so although that would be really bad, what I'm about to tell you is probably going to be even more shocking, <laughs> you know, and these, these are mine. And so just a lot of like, from that to really important, very serious stuff as well. But, but, um, and, and haven't had, um, any of these folks at my classes for a while and, and Denver and, and I don't know, just time constraints and stuff. But I think it's important also the programming with school. So I hope we get back, even if it's just virtual to some of that, whether it's Joel Salatin talking about food or, or, Oh, my mushroom guy, Paul Stamets, you know, coming to the college and giving a lecture if you, you know, so anyway. Uh, uh, all right. So let's move on to the chapter on the environment. Okay. Let me pull up that. Um, we are recording. Here we go, gonna do a little screen share. And I opened up some questions today. I think they will be the last questions that we will have. So I just opened up a whole bunch of them. Okay. All right, so uh, our natural world, right? Uh, the, the planet, the very thing that sustains us. Um, we're gonna be looking at this. I've already, so I'm gonna skip some of these questions. Um, but I think this is, uh, should be a more important chapter in these Social 100 books. So I'm going to roll through. There's Michael Reynolds. He's the guy that builds all the earthships down in Taos uh, for the last, you know, if you've seen Garbage Warrior, something that my classes usually watch. If you've never seen Garbage Warrior, it will blow your mind. It's an awesome hour long documentary. Go watch it and then go to earthship.com and look at what they're doing with sustainable architecture. You can stay in one of these things, or at least you used to be able to. You can take your time between semesters and go build some of these earth ships. And there's some in Fort Collins and around this area too. So I love Michael Reynolds and what he's doing with sustainability. Um, he and Paul Stamets, Paul Stamets is the mushroom guy looking at mycelium. He's another mind blowing, um, super, super smart and freaky guy. Michael Reynolds, the same way. A lot of times it's the freaks that are the geniuses that are figuring out new things. If you're one of those people in life, good for you. All right. Um, so I'm going to get to these questions later. Our, uh, the first one is, uh, would you be willing to eat less meat in order to slow global warming or climate change? Um, other one, are humans partially responsible for climate change, global warming? We'll look at those next time. That is a really cute polar bear. I will say this, we don't have to worry about him because he died years ago. Yep. Lack of food, no place to swim to, ice is melting, let's be real. I know, I'm not trying to be a bummer to everybody, but he's cute and he's dead. That's why we better do something about it. Oh my goodness. All right. So um, here's some questions like we always ask. What are the problems we're experiencing globally in regards to the environment? Who are those issues uh, impacting? And, and here's how these two are connected. What are the problems we're facing? But more importantly, and this is how I always want to teach it, what are the solutions to these problems? Because if we consistently see these things and frame challenges to our natural world as uh, problems and that there's no solution to it and that it's out of hand, I guarantee you people aren't going to do anything about it. Um, that is just one of the unfortunate pieces with people. So this goes to this, you know, a lot of the questions that we'd be looking at in this chapter, but I want us and I want you in particular, because this rests on your shoulders. It rests on the shoulders of my kids. Um, I mean, it's on my shoulders right now and yours too, but it's going to be there for a while. So why not think solution based, you know? Um, how can we fix some of these challenges, repair some of this? Can we repair some of it? And I'm going to tell you now, yes. What can we do to create a more sustainable approach to living? What does that mean? You are paying tens of thousands of dollars to attend the most sustainable university in the United States. I mean, it's good. And does it really mean anything? I mean, 
Actually, yes, it does. Um, I know you maybe thought I was going to mm, mm, dip and dive and go the other way, but no, it's a very extensive rubric. They look at things like housing and buildings and energy and what are you doing to save energy? What are you doing to conserve energy? What does your new building look like? Um, the composting thing here, like what, what type of food are you ordering? Uh, everything. And so for us, we were number one several years ago, then we dropped down to number two or three. I don't know. I just pay attention to these things. And then recently, again, in the number one position. So what's that mean for us on campus, for us here, or for college students across the United States? And what, probably the most important question I can ask you, what is our relationship with our natural world? What is our relationship to our natural world? What's that look like? Hey, you know, did you go camping with your parents a lot, pack it in, pack it out? Were you grow up in a city and you never did that? Did people, were you forced to garden with your parents and so you ended up hating it? Or were you forced to garden with your parents and you ended up loving it? Um, you know, was organic food a thing in your household? Was it not? So what is our relationship to our natural world? And as sociologists, we want to know that. Why do we want to know that? Because your relationship with your natural world is how you treat it. It's how you interact with it. And our behavior is what we want to be able to change, amend, and collectively get together and put in a positive direction um, in regards to some of the challenges we're facing. So it's, we want to know what people do because we've got to get people to do the right thing. And we're also looking at what people are doing. So, but we wouldn't practice sociology or study it if we weren't going to put it into practice. And that, that it, it, as a sociologist to me, if you're not doing active, not activist, but active sociology and putting it into practice, like if we're not feeding people and we're just talking about food and doing a food project, what good is that? It, it, to me, not as much. All right, so this is a really big sense of community, right? Environmental sociology is the study of community in the largest possible sense. And I don't mean like, hey, bro, we're all interconnected. Um, I mean, literally, you're breathing the air from Greeley we're drinking water that is an underground aquifer is located next to fracking things. We share this world, Fukushima. They have, they were talking about this like a month ago about how they were thinking about releasing radioactive seawater back into the sea. They've been doing that for five or six or seven years. That's how they cool it. They just pump that water. It goes back in to the ocean. We, we can see it on satellite. And now our tuna for years and years and years, on our coasts are irradiated. We are truly connected as a human community and not in just some spiritual sense, in a realistic biophysical way. So obviously we wanna emphasize how we understand it. We wanna be able to propose solutions to what's going on right now as human beings. Why do we have brains and thumbs if we're just gonna create problems? But that's a question that I'm asking you. Can humans be a positive factor or can humans actually make a positive impact on the environment? All right, we think about that during this uh, chapter. I'd like to think so. So we're looking at the study of the intersection of natural and human communities. Um, again, we're really focused here on solution-based thinking. Um, if I just focus on the problems, yikes. Um, you know, again, I know myself and I know a lot of people and it really, to me, it's like the class thing. If you think you can pass a class, you're gonna try. If you absolutely think there's no chance, then why bother? Um, so sometimes people think that it's too insurmountable. And if we're gonna get something done, we don't want to feel that way with, in regards to the environment. So we, you're a now professional sociologist. This is 15 weeks into the semester. Congratulations, we're all here. Um, we look at consumption, right? Uh, that's a big deal. I mean, how does our consumption, how does your consumption shape the environment? That's, you know, that's a question we should all be asking ourselves. Um, <clears throat> the economy, technology, development, population is a big piece. How about the health of our bodies and what we do with that or don't do with that? How do all those things shape our environmental conditions? Everything, every way that we interact um, with our natural world. And there's almost no place now, right, that our human worlds and our natural worlds do not intersect. So what are the repercussions of that? And, and can it be positive? And I guess one of the things we have to wrap our heads around is this idea that, you know, the economy keeps growing. Let's be realistic. It doesn't. There are a lot of people that look at this, they're economists that would say, and that's not me, that it started, stopped growing, excuse me, in the 1980s. And, and people have been looking for decades for more viable, realistic ways to measure economic growth. 
we just measure it as progress now and how much you, you generate in terms of like what you buy. But if you think about that, let's take cigarettes. Let's say you make a billion dollars and uh, you know, Camel cigarettes or whatever, Marlboro, they make a billion dollars right now. That's like, that's growth. That's all profit, but it's not right. That billion dollars has $250 million of health externalities. People get sick, people get cancer, people die. That's treatment. That's they can't go to work and the impact on the economy. So in a more modern way, if we were to look at this as an economic model, it wouldn't be that we're growing infinitely. It's what you make minus your costs. And so that is really what we need to shift here to when we start to look at economic models. We don't have economic, infinite economic growth, and we don't have infinite space right? We have as much earth as possible. And it's just, I don't know, it's so cringy when I hear somebody, NASA or somebody say, we found another planet. And that's cool because they did. And that's legit. But they're like, right, we found another planet that looks to be habitable like earth. Let me lay it out on the line for you. You know, I love Star Wars. There's like 15 Star Wars things right now in front of me that I could pick up at any one moment and show you how much I love Star Wars. But not you and not me. None of us are getting in a spaceship and going to that planet. As much as I want to, and as cool as I think it is, this is the only Earth we have. So when I hear those reports, I'm always like, oh, somebody just crumpled up a piece of paper and threw it out the window because, well, we got another planet out there somewhere. Um, so yeah, this is as much space as we have, as much Earth. Our economic growth is not infinite, and we need to look at how our consumption shapes the environment, because we might want to, oh, look at those people, right? In-group, out-group thinking. We've talked about that this semester. Those people, they have so many children, and it's such a stress on the environment. Yeah, they consume one three hundredth of what you do, of what we do here. So we have to look at our percentage of responsibility, right? Where is that responsibility going to lie? We have massive amounts of economic dealings. We have lots of industrial things. We have a huge impact on the environment. And if you as an individual are trying to do right by the environment, then somebody who owns a company that pollutes and dumps millions of gallons of toxins or whatever that is into the air of the ocean should have some proportionate share of making that better as well. We're going to look at that. What does that responsibility look like? Somebody just put a message. Sad because the majority of the pollution comes from companies, corporate. Yeah, absolutely. And we're not going to get anywhere by shaming everyday people, are we? No, like when's the last time you shamed your friends into doing something? But I bet you the night before a final, you found the coolest way to tell somebody that you could go out to the bar and have a good time and still study. Yeah, you can find ways to motivate people, but shaming them is not one of them, right? Like we can get creative about how we manipulate people, but usually not with shame. Um, you know, sociologists look at how culture, ideology, moral values, risk, and social experience influence the way we think and act towards the environment. So again, how you were socialized, how you treat the environment right now, what your relationship is with it right now is a product of everything you've experienced up to this point. So my question is, what were you taught to value about our natural world when you were growing up like that sticks with or influences your behavior today? Was it eco week at school? Was it, you know, growing food with your parents? Whatever. Um, Cause that's, if you want to know how people get to that point of climate denial, that's socialization. That's interaction. That's decades and decades and decades or whatever it is of that. And so, and we'll talk about climate denial and things like that as well too. But how about you? Meaning all of you out there. Um, what do you think? How are you socialized to interact with the environment? That's part of how you treat the environment today. Um, my family, we have a huge vegetable garden for the size of our property. It's pretty big and um my parents were always like really intent and like making me put my hands in the dirt and like no gloves just dirt and they were like really like we, we love the outdoors we buy national parks pass every year big camping people hiking the outdoors is like our bread and butter so it's like that was kind of like their main thing to teach me with the environment is that like if you want to go play in it you have to protect it and you know, that goes with everything. They like taught me recycling and like, um, just that kind of, you know, real easy environmental stuff and yeah. like, not consuming more than you need or living above your means kind of thing. All right. Good, good. Plus, so, oh, go ahead. My dad, he's a brewer, right? He brews beer. 
and we have these giant hop trellises every year and they're just full full of hops every year and it's does awesome. he have extra stuff like he has waste hops right <clears throat> oh absolutely yeah we put them in the freezer in a bag yeah see i would love to get i would love to find somebody around here that does that to give them to my chickens because yeah. i've heard that sometimes people donate them to farms to like for chickens to eat well, stuff. our neighbors across the street own chickens and we so over that. can no. they get drunk from the hops um i've never seen that but that might just be Jason Downing wanting to see if he can get his chickens drunk. I mean, I just, I'll admit it. I'll, I'll admit it. I'm interested. <laughs> I see things all the time, like squirrels. And I watch those videos. I'm that guy. Like squirrels eat a fermented something and then they're, and then they're drunk. I'll watch that. I'll watch that. So I'm just curious if my chickens would do the same thing. Good. All right. Who else? Something that your family valued or you were taught or school taught you somehow socialized about the environment. How's a part of you today? <clears throat> I mean, not anymore, but for quite a while I was a vegetarian because I really hated the conditions that animals were put through. Um, I'm not anymore, but I would like to be again just because there's no reason for me to eat meat. I don't even eat it that much. Um, but my best friend also does the same thing. Her family, uh, they go camping all the time and everything that we eat at their house, if it can be composted, they'll put it in a compost bin or they have it so like eggshells and like remaining vegetables they give it to their chickens because they have chickens so I kind of learned through her rather than like my family because my family isn't super like into nature and all that um I mean my mom likes camping but we never go uh so there's that okay good good um who else um, I'm kind of the same way, like ever since I was a kid, my family has been super into getting outdoors. So the time that I would spend with my family would be like camping and climbing and hiking and interacting with nature. So just from experiencing that and then being in nature, I've been taught like you never litter, you pick up other people's trash if it's in nature, like just basic stuff that you learn. And I feel like from being so young and growing up and having that connection with nature, it's almost impossible for me not to respect it, you know? just from what it gives me. So I feel like just growing up around it a lot and learning to respect it that way was super important. Yeah, I think, I, I wonder what that background thing is, like if you're in Colorado versus Illinois. Cause I grew up in Illinois and my kids are growing up in Colorado. But, but the difference I had was like my mom's mom was from Evergreen and they were teachers. So we didn't go to Disney World ever, we were too poor, but we did go out to Colorado every single year. And I fell in love with the mountains in Colorado, totally different than Illinois. And that became really special to me. We've been out here 20 years. I know it influenced my decision, but I think of growing up in Illinois and there's some places you can do nature preserves and stuff like that. But geographically, I wonder, no, I don't even wonder. I know sociologically, it must be more cemented with people. Pack it in, pack it out. I mean, I was never raised with that in Illinois, but my kids are here. And so it's a whole additional set of like, put out your fires, right? Most of the fires that are started here are from people out of state that, that didn't grow up just that's if you camp in Colorado and you're growing up in Colorado you know that my kids are like how many extra things of water will they bring to the fire they love it but they know that you know that that's not to be played with I never would have thought about that growing up in Illinois it's like humid rainy not dry totally the opposite never not even a lot of places to do the outdoor stuff um, other thoughts how you were raised or how it influences how you interact with the environment today or um, I was raised in Minnesota, and so my family, we'd always go to the Boundary Waters as, like, our family bonding time or whatever with my immediate family, and so I've always grown up thinking, like, especially with people wanting to m start mining in the Boundary Waters, it has been, like, super saddening to hear that because, like, if that gets hurt, then so many things in Minnesota go wrong, and so, like, um, I've just really grown up knowing like fresh water, clean water, like you camp, you, I don't, so I've really gotten to know the Minnesota environment and nature pretty well and also Colorado as well with the mountains and stuff. So I really appreciate the environment. Yeah. Um, uh, my partner's from Minnesota as well. Uh, and I used to do long before that, that I'd go up and do boundary water trips. Boundary waters is a very, very spiritual, awesome, just amazing, amazing place. If you've never done a trip up there, um, challenge yourself to a week up in the Boundary Waters. It's awesome. Um, good. Uh, when I was growing up in Southern Illinois, we had, uh, see people having all kind of bonfires, the really, really big kind. No one was ever worried. Now being here for 10 years, it's almost jarring. Yep. And I needed to get rid of this pile of sticks. 
and Storm had two friends outside with masks over because they just hadn't seen his buddies in a while and I lit that thing and this was just like a week ago and it's been wet down in the backfield and I've got all sorts of jugs of water around but I was standing in front of a 10 foot 15 foot flame and I'm like oh my neighbors are definitely gonna freak out and call about this one like it only lasted like three four minutes but I was like thinking that and I never would have thought that growing up with the fire um, as well being in a place that was always just that's just one the thing anybody else I just remembered a really quick one. It's kind of a fun thing. I'm a scuba diver, but I always forget I'm a scuba diver when like people ask me about myself. And that's a thing my family was like super duper into. And now that I think about it, it's like we are kind of part of this like ecotourism thing, scuba divers, just as like a whole culture. And um, we're actually going on a trip to Cosmo and we're doing um, like real minimal coral restoration on the Palanca Reef in Cosmo. So that's cool. <laughs> Somebody should write some time in a paper about yeah, the subculture, the family subculture of scuba divers. I love that. That's that's great. Oh, uh, Tyler, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, just as a uh, perspective aside from family, um, I worked for a little while at the Denver Zoo in part of their horticulture department, and there was a huge sec uh, focus in that uh, section of the staff on like renewables and uh, making sure any waste that we made was disposed of properly and. Uh, one of the big things was a browse program. So we would specifically choose native growing plants for Colorado that mimicked plants in animals' diets. Um, and that was just a really cool thing to kind of learn about and be a part of. But then on the other side, it was really interesting to kind of see the barriers to those that are in place. Um, the Denver Zoo used to have a fully functional biogas production facility that could keep them and surrounding areas uh, like supplied with gas to run specific vehicles, huh? but it had to shut down years ago because of complaints from the neighborhood about the noise and the smell. So there were uh, policies passed against it. Right. Um, so it was just kind of interesting to see like the frustration from the people who are trying really hard to like put yep. ideas forward and then having them get shut down. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, you should have seen though, the two rows of faces I was looking at when you're like, I worked at the Denver Zoo. Everyone's like, ah! Like it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> like definitely people's faces lighting up. Um, yeah, that's awesome. It's been too it long. Up. It's been too long since I've seen a hippopotamus eat a pumpkin. That's what, if you've never gone online and watched a video from one of these zoos of a mama hippopotamus and a baby hippopotamus eating pumpkins, please make that the next place you go right after class. <laughs> Simple pleasures in this life. Um, that's great. Yeah. Like we're going to talk about this in this chapter a bit, but like where does political ideology and policy and what people want to do for the environment and what they think is pot, like where does that intersect? And, and, and how can we get people to get on board with new creative sustainable ideas when people get stuck in ruts or I don't know, whatever that might be. Um, anybody else? Nope. Okay. All right. Let me screen share again here. And we, uh, we'll go for just a few more minutes and then we'll be done for the day. But um, all right. Uh, okay, so, um, and this is what I was talking about before that interconnectedness of all things, but we sociologists also want to know, how can we bring about a more ecological society? Again, there's nothing that a sociologist would study just to study. Like, we do definitely want to have an impact on something, whatever that is. So local, perhaps our most important focus that we can have in the present right now. Um, and I would say I've had this slide for a long time, but if we're going to be in a state of pandemic, you know, preparedness where we're at home or where we're not traveling around as much, if you think about it, this focus on local becomes even more important, you know, like you're not traveling as far. What does your community look like? Are people growing enough food? Are there libraries, those little pop-up libraries? You know, just what are people doing in their community? Because now we're, hey, if, if you're in a very small area, local just got a whole lot more local, right? And the interconnectedness of all things, what does that mean? So um, we look at the central role of social inequality, environmental conflict, social, or excuse me, environmental justice didn't really come about until the late, 60s, 70s, almost early 80s. Um, but now environmental justice, there's some pretty, pretty big 
uh, massive concerns and ways that we go about trying to seek environmental justice for folks. And, and uh, we'll talk about why that's important. The connections between local and global are huge, just like we look at micro and macro. And I think this is huge right here, the metaphor of community for understanding these things. Um, we are interconnected, we are in a global community, we're in your local community, you're in your country community. Uh, instead of tearing down community, we're gonna need to in an uncertain, and this is true with our environmental future, uncertain. Uh, economical future, uncertain. Sort of always is to a certain degree, but with the challenges that we're facing right now, understanding how we can build a stronger sense of community is something that we as sociologists um, know makes everything else work better. And then, though I personally don't feel, and I think this is important, I don't feel that um, issues of the environment are inherently political. That sounds like trash to me. Um, we all need to breathe clean air. We all need to drink clean water. That being said, some people are breathing cleaner air and drinking cleaner water and are not worried about the externalities of climate change and they make a disproportionate impact on that. So we do have to look at political institutions. But Jason, I'm a student in your class and I'm conservative and I'm Republican. That's fine with me. We, I'm not being biased against one party or the other. Not all Republicans hate the environment. Not all Democrats are tree huggers. But I gotta tell you what, you can look at voting records. And that tells that, that's the story. So if you want who has voted for what in regards to the environment, I'm gonna tell you right now, it shouldn't be drawn on party lines, especially when Republicans and gosh, Nixon were in, responsible for the EPA and so many other important things. It can't change in 30 years to where now Republicans vote no all the time on the environment, Democrats vote no part of the time and yes part of the time it needs to be everybody in all the time and i'll tell you why because if you do things ahead of time instead of reacting to things you save billions and billions of dollars and we will look at that we will look at what those economic models are you don't need to make an emotional plea and tie yourself to a tree and tell one of your neighbors that that's it if they take this tree down you need to tell them if they're truly conservative and they want to save money putting money into it ahead of time saves you billions hundreds of billions, trillions, and we will look at that cited and sourced for sure. If you had done that like people had asked for for Katrina and the levees, you would have spent tens of millions, not hundreds of millions. We know this, climate change, you can make a huge impact and save trillions by putting money into these programs. So first of all, we gotta get away from that, we can't afford it. If you wanna breathe, if you wanna drink water, if you wanna survive, we're in that realm now. We're in survival mode now. And so that's why it has to continually be more important. And we need, it needs to be more important than politics. And we need to make sure that our political institutions are doing the will, following the will of the people and not the money that they're getting. And we understand that. And why do you say that, Jason? You sound passionate about it. I am. I also like living. I'm cool with breathing air that's not poison. And I particularly like drinking water that won't kill me. I think everybody is. I think I can speak for the politicians on both sides of the aisle when I say water that doesn't kill you is a good thing. All right, we're in an environmental predicament. So why do we have a, con a concern for this condition, right? And then this is where we'll leave it today because we all know we have changes, uh, challenges to sustainability, challenges to environmental justice, and here's the deal. I've been seeing some great stuff about the Lorax and wearing masks and stuff, but let's just say this. Nobody is standing up right now on Capitol Hill saying, what are the rights and beauty of nature? Nobody. Are we waiting for the Lorax to come out of thin air and be like, I want to take care of nature. I'm not being snarky here. I'm being deadly serious. We do not often enough ask ourselves, what are the rights of nature? Before we open up the Arctic to drilling, before we open up parks that we've protected forever and ever, before we dam another, create another reservoir, dam another river, what are the rights and beauty of nature? We need to ask ourselves that question. We need political institutions that shift dollars around and make decisions to ask that question. And as sociologists, we're cool. So of course we ask that question, right? All right. So let me see here. I thought maybe there were some questions that I, oop, or some things that were typed. Hot takes. Um, uh, gonna cosplay as the Lorax. Yeah, please. I'm fine with cosplaying the Lorax. If, if somebody go, okay, if somebody, no, I but nope, I'm not gonna say that. I better not say it. I was gonna say, if somebody goes to a state legislative office dressed as the Lorax and gets arrested, I'll pay for your uh, court bills. 
but it's not safe during COVID right now. And really folks, nobody in this class has a beard like the Lorax like me, so I should do this myself. I should dress up like the Lorax. Hmm, you've got, you got me thinking. I've got myself thinking. Any opportunity to watch baby hippos eat food, pandas eat ice cream, I'm there. Also, maybe is dressing up as the Lorax. Ah, uh, yes, all right, so let's see here. We still turn our overdue assignments. If you get arrested, I will absolutely bail you out. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a sociology teacher, they're not really, they're not the worth their salt if they haven't been arrested a few times. They might not tell you that, but these are the people that have been involved with human rights for a long time. I mean, I was on academic probation three times during my master's degree. Come on. I, I was. Did I tell you that story already? No, I'm not going to tell you that story. But I do remember telling my mom that one week into getting my master's degree, and she's like, figures. She knew, she knows my fire. She knew that I was going to be there getting in trouble for the right to all sorts of things. Nope, not telling the story. Anyway, I do not, hi I, I highly recommend you not getting on academic probation um, or going anywhere right now without a mask. Uh, and what you do is cosplay in your free time is up to you. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, if you have, look, if you have overdue assignments, turn them in for some points. If it's the big paper, definitely turn it in. Um, our guiding practice here has been compassion. Now that doesn't mean that I want to disadvantage a hundred other people because five people didn't turn it in and didn't care to or didn't work on it. I'm, I'm just not really worried about that right now. If you have something to turn in, we'll take a look at it. Discussions cannot be remade up, things like that. And of course, we're in the last bit of time. But if a paper's worth 150 points, even if you're going to only get 100 out of that, that's, that's important business. Okay. Um, please be on the lookout for a study guide. Remember, you won't need it till Wednesday. But if you have to take exams one, two, or three, then you can head back to the, uh, the uh, announcements board. And that's where those study guides are. Um, if you need to reach out to me for any other reason, please do. Any last questions? Um, I'm fine. I'm not in a rush here. I got, uh, I don't know what I have to do today. Can content assignments be made up? Um, they're not worth a lot of points, but yeah, we, we will give some points. And this is, there's not going to be too many rolling in for us to give a look at. They're not going to be worth full points, but if you want to do them, I would. Um, I've told, you know, I've told the GTAs, our, our guiding thing every semester is compassion. So I told everybody that's doubled this semester just because. But, but like I said at the beginning of class, I'm your teacher, not your buddy. We got deadlines, you know? Maybe after the semester, I'll be your buddy, but right now, got it? Nope, nope. <laughs> I mean, we're friends, but you know, you got me a plant. We're more, okay, we're more than just, we're, we're friends. We're friends with plant benefits, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, what's the last day the exam is open for? I'm not really sure. You'll have to open that up tomorrow and see the details. I know that we were thinking about opening it up for Wednesday, Wednesday through Friday at least. Okay, so plan on taking it Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. There, we, we're not opening it up again for exam, for the makeup exam, or excuse me, for, the, for either. But for exam four, you don't want to miss it. So don't think that you could take it on Saturday without checking because I'm not really sure. If a GTA wants to extend it in one of my classes to Saturday, I'm not gonna override that, but I'm not sure what the plans are for our GTAs in particular. So um, you'll have to open up quizzes uh, or send them an email or maybe they're watching this video. All right, um, anything else? Anything else? All right, um, I've had a fantastic semester. I know it's weird, I know it's all online. I know we have a fraction of the people uh, that are showing up, but I know people are watching these things at their own time because I'm looking at the playlist for them and it's like, what? I just put this video up yesterday and there's 200 views. So I know that people are watching. And if you're not watching in real time, that's cool with me too. But you need to know that I way more appreciate, sorry, I'm just gonna be real, the people have been tuning in whose faces I recognize, just like the people that would be coming into class every day. I think that's awesome. All right, I'm gonna go play with some puppies. That's Alma the Pitbull. Oh, I love her. Uh, she's my little snuggle muscle. All right, go out there and uh, finish this semester strong, everybody. Peace. Take care. Reach out to me. I'll be around through email or Zoom or whatever. <laughs>